In this video, I'm going to talk about tonicity. So tonicity is defined as the relative solute concentration of one solution compared to another solution. Okay, so we're looking at the solute concentration, that is the amount of solute in each of these solutions to, to basically make any statement in regards to tonicity in the terms I'm about to teach you, you need to be comparing one solution to another. Okay? Some students think it's just a relative term that refers to all solutions, but we're comparing one solution to another. Okay? So there are three prefixes you're going to encounter when we're talking about tonicity. Those prefixes are iso, hyper, and hypo. So ISO you hopefully have seen in your lecture previously when talking about isotopes or isomers. And the thing you need to always know about this prefix is it means the same or similar. And remember, these are going to come before the word tonicity or tonic. And we're comparing solute concentrations between solutions. So, an isotonic solution has the same relative solute concentration as another solution. Hyper, if you think of a kid who is hyperactive, they have too much energy. Hyper means greater than. So, this is higher slash greater or an excess. So, a hypertonic solution has a greater solute concentration than another solution. And hypo, we're going to have lower, less, okay, or it's going to be under. So, a hypotonic solution will have a lower solute concentration than the other solution. So let's go ahead and look at this in context of what you did in the lab. Okay. So we're going to use iso, hyper, and hypotonic. We're going to talk about the direction in which osmosis will occur, water will diffuse, and then we're going to talk about what that does to either a bag of solution or cells. Okay. So isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic, tonicity. So let's start with the beaker exercise that you performed. Okay, so here are my beakers. Okay, so there are my beakers. And I'm going to fill these beakers with different solutions. In one beaker, I'm going to place water. In one beaker, I'm going to place 10% sucrose. And in the final one, I'm also going to place 10% sucrose. Then what you did was you took dialysis tubing and you made a bag filled with some solution. So in one of those bags, uh, in the one that you placed in the water beaker, you put 10% sucrose. And one of those bags that you put into the 10% sucrose beaker, you put water. And in the final example, you took a bag with 10% sucrose and you placed it into a beaker with 10% sucrose. Okay, now let's talk about a couple of different things before we start classifying these as hyper, hypo, or isotonic. First and foremost, what I tell my students to always do whenever you're given an example like this is write everything out. Okay, so we're going to do that right now. So for this first one, we're going to do bag, and we're going to do beaker. 
So the bag has 10% sucrose. And if it's a 10% sucrose solution, then I know that it's going to be 90% water by volume. And this is an alternative way to look at this. Meanwhile, my beaker is pure water. So it's going to be 0% sucrose. And it's going to be 100% water. Now, the book tells you that osmosis always occurs in the direction from the lower solute concentration to the higher solute concentration. So just to kind of give it away, our direction of osmosis is going to be like this, from the beaker to the bag. So the water is going to move from the beaker into the bag. So this bag we expect to gain mass because water is going into the beaker. I'm sorry, into the bag. Water is going into the bag from the beaker. So we expect to see this bag gain mass. So one way you can remember that is that osmosis always occurs in the direction from the lower solute concentration to the higher solute concentration. There's more sucrose in this solution in the bag than there is in the beaker. So higher solute concentration, direction of osmosis. But if you write everything out and you know what diffusion is, you can also look at it this way. We have 100% water by volume here and only 90%. So our water is going from the higher percentage to the lower percentage of water. So from 100% to 90%. And the direction is still the same. Okay. So our bag gains mass because our water moves into the bag. So the question is then, this solution in the bag, is it hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic? Okay. Well, first and foremost, our sucrose amounts are not equal, so we know it's not isotonic. So the question then is, is this solution in the beaker hyper or hypo? Well, hyper was a solution that has a higher solute concentration, and hypo was defined as a solution that has a lower solute concentration. The beaker has a lower solute concentration than the bag, so the solution in the beaker would be defined as a hypotonic solution compared to the solution in the bag. So the solution in the beaker is hypotonic to the solution in the bag. Now, let's move on to the next one. So now we've got water in the bag, 10% sucrose in the beaker. So I'm again going to draw this all out. Bag, beaker. So I'm going to again draw this all out. So in the bag, I've got 100% water, 0% sucrose. In the beaker, I've got 90% water and 10% sucrose. Okay. So again, water, the direction of osmosis is going to be from lower solute concentration to higher solute concentration, or again, it's the way I drew the water percentages from the higher percentage of water to the lower percentage of water. So in this particular example, water is going to diffuse out of the bag and into the beaker. So the direction of water is going out of the bag and into the beaker. Okay. And that means then also we can classify the solution in the beaker based upon its solute concentration compared to that of the bag. So again, solute concentrations are not equal, so we can say isotonic is out. Then if we look at it, okay, higher solute concentration outside of the bag and in the beaker than inside the bag. So that would mean that the solution in the beaker is classified as hypertonic to the solution in the bag. Okay, so again, the solution in the beaker in this example is hypertonic to the solution in the bag. All right, finally, our last example here. Break it down one more time. Bag, beaker, 
And we've got 10% sucrose in the bag and 90% water. We've got 10% sucrose in the beaker and 90% water. And of course, here we have equal amounts of solute in terms of its concentration in both the beaker and the bag. So what we're going to find is there's going to be an equal rate of diffusion in and out of the bag because this is isotonic. So the solution in the beaker is isotonic to the solution in the bag. What this means in terms of the mass, we should see no change in mass in this bag. While over here in this hypertonic solution where water left the bag, we should see the bag lose mass. Okay, so again, the solution in this beaker is hypotonic to the solution in this bag. The solution in this beaker is hypertonic to the solution in this bag. The solution in this beaker is isotonic to the solution in this bag. And the result of those differing tonicities is this bag here will gain mass because water moves into the bag. This bag here will lose mass because water diffuses out of the bag. And this bag here should show little to no change in mass because the water is going to flow in and out equally because the water is at relative equilibrium between the bag and the beaker. Okay. So, that's the concept of hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic in the context of the bag and beaker scenario. And here's what you expected to see in regards to the masses of those different bags. So in the lab, we looked at tonicity in the context of red blood cells, okay. so what you did here was you took a test tube that had red blood cells that were placed in one of three solutions. Okay. In one instance, the red blood cell was placed in an isotonic solution. In one instance, the red blood cell was placed in a hypertonic solution. And in the final instance, the red blood cell was placed in a hypotonic solution. Remember, the tonicity is in comparison to that of the red blood cell. So in the isotonic solution, these red blood cells, which normally have this nice uniform circular shape, remain with that same morphology because if it's isotonic it means the solute concentration outside of the cell and inside the cell are equal so water is going to move in and out of the cell at an equal rate we're not going to see any swelling or shrinking or anything like that so the cell remains pretty much the way it was before in a hypertonic solution if you recall what that meant it means this solution has a higher solute concentration than the solution inside the cell. So what's going to happen is, as we place these cells in here, water is going to move from the area of lower solute concentration, which is inside the cell, to the solution that has the higher solute concentration, which is outside the cell. What this does is it actually causes the cell to shrivel due to the change in pressure of the water moving out. Okay? This state of the cell, of a red blood cell, is referred to as crenated. And it basically is a sign that the solution that this red blood cell is in is hypertonic. So the cell doesn't burst, it collapses upon itself and takes on this shriveled-like state. So nice, uniform and round, shriveled-like state. Okay, Because the water left the cell, moved to the area of higher solute concentration. And finally, in a hypotonic solution, that's telling you that the solute concentration inside of the cell is higher than the solute concentration outside of the cell. So water is actually going to move 
to the area of higher solute concentration, so it's going to go into the cell. Now, red blood cells have a plasma membrane as their outermost structure. All of that additional water pressure is going to cause the cell to expand and eventually burst. So the cell is going to burst. And on this particular slide, you most likely didn't see any red blood cells. You probably actually only saw cellular debris because all those red blood cells, for the most part, that were placed in this hypotonic solution burst. Okay, so again, isotonic. Solute concentration inside the cell and outside the cell are equal, so water is going to go in and out at an equal rate. Hypertonic solution. When we place red blood cells in that, the solute concentration outside the cell is greater than the solute concentration inside the cell, so water flows out of the cell rapidly to establish equilibrium, okay? causing the cell to collapse and enter that crenated state okay? when placed in a hypertonic solution. When a red blood cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, so this solution has a lower solute concentration than the solution inside the red blood cell, water goes into the cell causing it to expand and eventually burst. So we talked about the effect of tonicity on animal cells, those red blood cells. Now I want to talk about tonicity and its effect on plant cells. So in this particular exercise, we used Elodia, or Elodia, which we had used previously in the microscopy lab. And we prepared two solutions in two different beakers or containers. One of those solutions was just water, and the other was 20% sodium chloride. Placing an LED leaf into water um, and comparing the two solutions, that inside of the cells of the leaf and the water outside, the water is actually hypotonic. If we compare the 20% sodium chloride solution to the solution inside of the LED leaf cells uh, and compare the relative tonicities, this solution is going to be hypertonic. Okay, so if we draw our plant cell in both instances. Knowing what we know in terms of the direction in which majority of the water is going to diffuse initially uh, in regards to a hypotonic solution and a hypertonic solution, what we will find in the water is that water is going to actually move into the LED leaf cell. Whereas over here, in the hypertonic solution, the 20% sodium chloride, water is going to rush out of that LED leaf cell. Okay, now, let's talk about how this is going to differ from the animal cells. So first and foremost, plant cells, as you may recall, have a cell wall as their exterior surface compared to the plasma membrane of animal cells. The animal cells, when we place them in a hypotonic solution, they eventually swelled and burst. That's not going to happen here. Instead, what's going to happen is these plant cells are going to bulge. They're going to be very, very bloated and exist in a state that's referred to as turbid. You're going to see the chloroplast inside of these LED leaf cells. And if they're placed in a hypotonic solution, then they should be pretty evenly dispersed throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay? So hypotonic, uh, a hypotonic solution results in this turgid state, and this turgid state is actually the state in which most plants have their cells, um, and it's good for the plant. If plants are actually placed in an isotonic solution, typically it results in the osmotic pressure inside the cell to be decreased. That results in the plant wilting. So this is the preferential state for most plant cells. Okay. So a turbid state because the water's moving in, adding that additional pressure to the, um, the plant cell. Okay. Now with a hypertonic solution, again, the outermost structure on these cells is a cell wall. So we're not going to see the cell collapse like we did with the animal cell, with those red blood cells. But what we are going to see is the plasma membrane 
inside of these cells is going to collapse. And as it shrinks, all of those organelles are going to be pulled closely together. All those organelles that occupy the cytoplasm okay, are going to be pulled closely together. So what you should have seen in these cells was all of the chloroplasts bunching up in one area of the cell. It doesn't necessarily have to be the center. It can be one of the sides. But you're going to see all the chloroplasts bunch up. This particular state is referred to as plasmalized. So this cell has been plasmalized because it has been placed in a hypertonic solution. So this cell is plasmalized because it is in a hypertonic solution. Okay? This is not a good state for these plant cells to be in. Even though their cell wall retains its relative shape, having the plasma membrane collapse like that is very, very detrimental for these cells. So that's the way that plant cells differ from animal cells when placed in a hypotonic or a hypertonic solution.